These are the two most deadly plateaus in Asia, the Tibetan Plateau and the Mongolian Plateau. Tibetan Plateau, harsh, thousands of meters above sea level, has some of the highest mountains in the world. The Himalayas, impenetrable. The Mongolian Plateau, equally harsh, equally extreme, has some of the worst natural disasters on Earth. The Gobi Desert, impenetrable. These terrains are so deadly that the land itself still kills dozens of people every year and remains the two least populated regions on Earth. The extreme weather, high elevation, and endless desert made the interaction of these two plateaus nearly impossible for millenniums. People speak different languages, use different writing systems, eat different food, and have very different lifestyles. The Tibetans and Mongols shouldn't have anything in common. But in reality, they have so much in common that sometimes it is hard to tell one from the other. And to be more specific, the resemblance only goes one way. Mongolia resembles Tibet, not the other way around. And not just Mongolia, Inner Mongolia looks very much like Tibet too. And the list doesn't stop here. Basically, every region with a strong Mongolic influence looks a lot like Tibet. Not just monasteries, not just some Tibetan words popping up on the streets here and there, That's the day. but literally every single word on every Mongolian oval I've ever seen, which is a lot, is Tibetan. Mongols even adopted the Tibetan calendar. On the same day that Tibetans celebrate their New Year, Mongols also celebrate. And there are even more similarities in medicine, art, clothing, food, and even names. As a matter of fact, the Mongolian language itself is filled with Tibetan. Generations of Mongols use Tibetan words for their names. All this, 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 and all of this are popular names among the Mongols that are actually Tibetan. And the Mongols are still using these names to this very day. And you know what the best part is? Many of them don't even know what their Tibetan names mean. And this is a real problem. I'm not making this up. To fix this, Mongolian scholars spent years doing research in Tibet and came up with this list, matching the Tibetan words with their Mongolian translations. But this only solves part of the problem because some of the Tibetan words are so old that even my Tibetan friends didn't know what they meant. So just imagine yourself not only being named in a foreign language, but not knowing what your name means for your entire life. How is this okay for Mongols? You might say, well, Mongols conquered many civilizations in the past. It's only normal for them to adopt a thing or two from other civilizations. Yep, you are absolutely right. But ever wondered why, out of all these conquered lands, hundreds of different civilizations, why Tibetan? What's so unique about it? But I guess the thing that shocked me the most is that the last imperial leader of Outer Mongolia, the ace book the Gigin, the one who declared Mongolia's independence, Guess what? He wasn't even Mongolian. The guy was Tibetan. He was born in Tibet. And not just him. So was the seventh, sixth, fifth, fourth, and third Bogdag again. Ever since the year 1763, all supreme leaders of Outer Mongolia were Tibetans. Every single one of them, except for the first two, who also spent years in Tibet and spoke Tibetan flawlessly. And in case you're wondering, Inner Mongolia was like that too, only six decades earlier. How is this even possible? Why were the Mongols, once the most ferocious people on earth, famous and infamous for butchering, conquering, and plundering, okay with this being under Tibetan rule for centuries and to this very day, still heavily influenced by them? So naturally, some questions arise. What was going on between these two plateaus? Why did Tibetans rule Mongols for so long? And more importantly, how did this full-blown comprehensive Tibetanization happen to the Mongols? To find out the answer to that, over the past few years, I went to see many monasteries in Tibet, Qinghai, Beijing, Inner Mongolia, and Mongolia. I had some very interesting conversations with the lamas, my Tibetan and Mongolian friends, and I can guarantee you, the Tibetanization of Mongolia is a fascinating story, unlike anything you've ever heard. It is unique. Let's get into it.
Bye. Before we start our journey, let's get some terminology out of the way. So there are four main Mongolian subgroups around the Gobi Desert. The ones who live west of the Gobi are the Dunga, or the Western Mongols. Those living southwest of the Gobi are the Upper Mongols. The ones who live south of the Gobi are the Inner Mongols. And those who live north of the Gobi are the Karka, or the Outer Mongols. And the next step is to prepare our story map. Let's start with the map of China. So we have the Tibet Autonomous Region here, and the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region there. They're both enormous, together making up a quarter of China's land area. But ethnically speaking, the Tibetan and Mongolian sphere don't stop there. Because you see, China doesn't just have autonomous regions for Mongols and Tibetans. It also has many, many Mongolian and Tibetan autonomous counties and prefectures. And some of those prefectures are larger than nations. So if we map the two Tibetan autonomous prefectures in Sichuan province, one in Yunnan province, one in Gansu province, six in Qinghai province, one Tibetan autonomous county in Gansu province, and one in Sichuan province, the Tibetan cultural sphere based in China actually looks like this. But if we look beyond China and map the countries and regions historically and culturally influenced by the Tibetans, such as Bhutan, part of Nepal, and part of India, the Tibetan culture sphere in the world looks like this. Similarly, if we map the four Mongolian autonomous counties in northeast China, one in Hebei, one in Gansu, one in Xinjiang, and one in Qinghai, two Mongolian autonomous prefectures in Xinjiang, and one in Qinghai, the Mongolian culture sphere based in China actually looks like this. And similarly, if we map all the countries and regions that are historically and culturally influenced by the Mongols, such as the country of Mongolia, the Republic of Buryatia, part of the Republic of Tuva, part of Central Asia, and let's not forget the cousins by the Caspian Sea, the Kalmyks. The Republic of Kalmykia is, by the way, the only region in Europe where Tibetan Buddhism is the predominant religion. Speaking of Kalmyks, I've actually met one many, many years ago in Portugal. And he's perhaps the most famous Kalmyk Mongol in the world. I mean, even the queen wrote him a letter. The guy is an artist who uses coffee and wine to paint. We chatted a bit in Mongolian and put on a small show for the group. Not a very good dancer, I know. Well, in the end, he gave me this lovely painting of Kublai Khan, which is a character that will be intensely discussed in today's video. Anyways, if we map all these regions together, the Mongolian culture sphere in the world looks like this. And out of all this, there's one region I'd like you to pay special attention to, as a lot of stories I'm gonna cover in this video happen right there. And you've probably already noticed it, it is the province of Qinghai, where Mongolia meets Tibet. These two cultures overlap so much that in Qinghai province, there is an entire prefecture larger than Italy called Haixi Mongolian and Tibetan Autonomous Prefecture. When I was there, I found every sign on the street written in three languages, Tibetan, Mongolian, and Chinese. Okay, now our story map is more or less ready. And when I look at this vast empty land, it reminds me of something Jeremy Clarkson once said in the Grand Tour. And the other thing is, Genghis Khan created in just 20 years the biggest empire the world has ever seen. Why? It's not like he was cramped here. That is a very good point. Why did Mongols conquer so much? Yeah, the weather was bad at the time, there was a drought, people were starving, blah blah blah. But isn't this a bit too much? I don't know about you, but this doesn't look very logical to me, because any war, east or west, now or then, costs an enormous amount of money, time, and manpower. To conquer all this was incredibly expensive and exhausting. Besides, many of the conquered lands were conquered for no clear reason, as if the Mongols were fighting and conquering just for the sake of fighting and conquering. I mean, it almost seemed religious to me. Things like this never happened before or after, as it goes against human nature to conquer so much land 
with so few people for such a long time. So there got to be some spiritual power behind this endless war. Maybe the Mongol conquest didn't just seem religious. Maybe it was religious. Ever wonder why Chinggis is called Chinggis? I mean, for most of his life, the guy was known as Timjin. Somebody else gave him this name, and the Mongol conquest began immediately after the name change. So, who gave Chinggis the name Chinggis, and did this name giver have anything to do with the Mongol conquest? To answer this question, we must look at a very special, very primitive, and perhaps the oldest religion on our planet: shamanism. Like many tribal people in Siberia, China, Korea, Japan, shamanism is Mongolia's native religion. And those who can tell fortunes, summon ghosts, talk to the god, and cure diseases, are known as shamans. A good analogy for a shaman is a combination of doctor and priest who knows about the future, the past, history, nature, medicine, and a lot of spiritual stuff that I can understand. And That's kind of the point. Ordinary people are not supposed to understand what shamans do. They are the explainers, problem solvers, and decision makers of the tribe. The history book told us that in 1206, Timjin united Mongol tribes and became Chinggis. But exactly how did he do that? Well, he was indeed good at war, but that wasn't a big deal, especially in a harsh place like Mongolia, where everyone was good at war. What's truly important was how you handle the mess after the war. If the conquered tribes couldn't be integrated properly, then your victory would only bring you a ticking time bomb. Besides, the nomad tribes back then lived far from each other, minded their own business, and would die protecting their tribes. So even if you manage to unite all the Mongol tribes successfully, it is still incredibly hard to convince them to step out of their comfort zone and go on an exciting journey full of blood, feces, and deaths. With you, I mean, there is a reason why so many men before and after Chinggis tried the same thing and failed. So, what did Chinggis do differently? You see, Chinggis wasn't doing all this by himself. There was a very special person behind him that made all the difference. This guy not only helped him unite all the Mongol tribes and gave him the title Chinggis, but according to some, was why Mongols conquered so tirelessly. His name was Kokchu, the most important shaman in human history. Kokchu was like a half brother to Chinggis. He was the grand shaman of the Mongol Empire and the person Chinggis trusted the most. He proclaimed Timjin as Chinggis and took the title Tepingli himself, which literally means heavenly messenger. As a shaman, he stood above tribe, race, and nation. Once Chinggis got his support, unification became easy. Because Kokchu spoke the view of the god, and when he recognized the legitimacy of Chinggis, most Mongols stopped resisting. With his help, Chinggis unified Mongol tribes at a minimum cost and integrated them perfectly into his own. In many ways, shamanism helped the Mongols conquer the world. But the mystical nature of shamanism and its enormous influence over the masses. Quickly became a threat to the Mongol Khans, and the most powerful and most destructive shaman was Kokchu himself. Because you see, to ordinary people, Kokchu was not exactly human. Chinggis might be the greatest leader, but at the end of the day, he was just another mortal that made mistakes and lost battles. While Kokchu was something else. And in the first three years of the Mongol conquest, from 1206 to 1209, Chinggis lost many, many battles and made a lot of mistakes. As the Mongols trespassed into the territory of one of their worst enemies, to the Mongol soldiers it was their first nightmare, but to Chinggis Khan, it was his last. And the war with them cost Mongols dearly and eventually killed Chinggis Khan. These hardy warriors were the Tanguts, and their empire was known as the Great Xia. 
Chinggis tried many things to subjugate them. Once he even built a dam and redirected the Yellow River into the Tangut capital, which worked until it didn't. The dam was breached, the flood reversed, and completely wiped out the Mongol camps. The constant setback and defeats at the hands of the Tangus made the Mongols question Chinggis' leadership, and his position became shaky. Meanwhile, more and more people rallied around Shaman Kokchu, and he believed the time to replace Chinggis had finally arrived. Within the next few years, there were a lot of betrayals and backstabbing between these two, and uh, finally, Chinggis had him killed. The Tangut Mongol War was on and off for over 20 years until September 1227, when the Mongols finally sacked the Tangut capital and slaughtered the city's population. And just days before the Mongols took the Tangut capital, Chinggis Khan died. But the threat from the shamans didn't die with him. The second Han Okde with his shamans sacrificed his younger brother Tole to cure his illness. Seeing how shamans manipulated the court and how easily they sacrificed the royals, the following Hans were alerted and were actively looking for alternatives to shamanism. The third Khan Guyuk supported the Christians, and told his sons, the fourth Han Monk and the fifth Han Kublai, were even more careful about this as shamans took their father's life. But despite giving respect and support to other religions, the first four Mongol Khans didn't formally adopt any foreign religions. Mongolian shamanism was still the backbone of the empire. But since the fifth Han Kublai, things had taken a different turn. After the fall of the Tangut Empire in 1227 and the complete destruction of the Jin Empire in 1234, Tibetan Empire, Korean Empire, and the Chinese Empire were the next three targets for the Mongols. Initially, the Mongols wanted to conquer the Chinese and Koreans first, but like the Tanguts, the Chinese and Koreans resisted fiercely, and the Mongols had a hard time fighting them. So they extended their influence into Tibet and more importantly to secure a pass to sandwich the Chinese from the rear the Mongols made Tibet their next target. You see, the second Khan Okde had a son called Golden. In 1239, he was granted a piece of land here, right in the middle of the Mongolian and Tibetan plateaus. So in the following year, he sent an invasion force of 30,000 soldiers into Tibet. When the army finally reached the valley north of Lhasa, the killing started. The Chalakhan Monastery was burned and most of the monks in Rutin Monastery were slaughtered. However, when the Mongols reached the Drigong Monastery, an avalanche of stones stopped their attack. The Mongols were very impressed by that, and they saw the monks here had some kind of superpower, so they were like, okay folks, who's in charge of Tibet? We want to talk to them. The head of the monastery was like, um, it's probably hard for you to believe, but we haven't had a real government here for hundreds of years. But if you really need to talk to a Tibetan authority, you should perhaps talk to this guy, Sajja Bandita. Before we dive even deeper into this, I have to give you a very, very brief introduction to Tibetan Buddhism. Like every other religion, Tibetan Buddhism also developed a dozen different schools over the centuries, each having many followers. Among them, there are four major schools, Nyingma, Kaju, Sajja, and Galu. And to further simplify the terminology here, we're going to narrow the four major schools into two categories, the Red School and the Yellow School. The Red School includes three older schools. It was named for the red hats monks wear on former occasions. The Yellow School includes only the youngest one, Galu. It was named for the yellow hats monks wear on former occasions. I will go deeper into this in another video, but for now, that's all you need to know the red school and the yellow school, red and yellow. And when the Mongol soldiers first came to Tibet in the 13th century, the red school was in charge. So when Golden heard about this whole thing about Tibet, he invited Sajja Bandita to his court in 1244. After arriving, Sajja Bandita greatly impressed the Mongols with his personality, powerful teachings, and knowledge of medicine. Under Sajja Bandita's authority, Tibet submitted to the Mongols. 
After he died, his nephew Trija Papa became the new leader of the Red School. Over the next few years, Trija Papa traveled across the Mongol Empire, became friends with many Mongol royals, and converted a very, very important person. Kublai. When Kublai Khan became the fifth Mongol Khan in 1260, he formally adopted Red School Tibetan Buddhism as the state religion, starting the first stage of Mongolia's Tibetanization. Monasteries and temples were built across the empire, and Trija Papa was appointed as the preceptor of the kingdom. Hello, viewers. This is Miaoying Temple, more commonly known as the White Pagoda Temple. And the pagoda behind me is both the largest and the oldest Tibetan pagoda in China. It's magnificent. It was built in 1279 by Kublai Khan to host Buddha's relics. It's 51 meters tall, and the diameter is over 30 meters. And if you look closely, you can see the 13 circular bands of molding which is called the 13 heavens. And at the very top, there is a tiny pagoda made of bronze, overlooking Beijing. And the white pagoda was designed and built by this guy, Arniko, a Nepalese architect that happened to be a student of Trija Papa. This is where the Mongol emperors of the Yuan Empire came to pray. They held large Buddhist activities, and monks from every corner of the nation gathered here to exchange ideas and thoughts. And it is also where Buddhist classics and scriptures were printed and translated into Mongolian and Chinese. But then, like shamanism, Tibetan Buddhism also went out of control. During the last decades of the Yuan Empire, Tibetan Buddhism aroused great public outrage, and the lamas became absolutely lawless. According to history of Yuan, they were bullying the commoners, causing trouble, corrupting, and raping women. The lamas even dared to beat and humiliate the Mongol royals, and royals turned against each other because of Tibetan Buddhism, which was one of the leading forces that destroyed the empire. But about 11 years before the collapse of the Yuan Empire, a boy was born in Qinghai, where Mongolia meets Tibet. And he was indeed the child of two plateaus, as he was born to a Mongol father and a Tibetan mom. The boy traveled intensely all over Tibet, learned from masters of all schools of Tibetan Buddhism, and had his own realizations. He also wrote many books, gained a lot of followers, built a monastery in Lhasa called Gandam, and would later found a school of his own, the Luke, the Yellow School. And despite being the youngest, his Yellow School would eventually dominate Tibetan Buddhism till this very day. His name was Tsongkhapa. Every morning, the lamas in uh, Mongolia will do the chanting and praying. And it's broadcast throughout the city. You can see the live streaming of the praying too. The thing that really amazed me in Mongolia is that you can see the, you know, the Tibetans everywhere. In any temple, there are Tibetan uh, letters written. But at the same time, most Mongolians, and I mean more than 99.9% .9 of Mongolians, uh, they speak no Tibetan at all. So when they go to the temples, monasteries, 
They sit there, they listen to the lamas chanting in Tibetan, but、uh, the believers themselves, they don't understand a word of what they are saying. They were just there, praying, and it somehow just worked for 500, 600 years. Mongols knowing no Tibetan, listening to Tibetan every morning, is part of their life. The scriptures you see everywhere, none of them read it. When Zhong Kiba died in 1419 at 62, he was already a well-known figure in Tibet. After he passed away, his disciples worked endlessly spreading his teachings, and by the end of the 15th century, the Yellow School had become one of the most popular schools in Tibet. Many of Zhong Kiba's followers became extremely influential in Tibet. Some built great monasteries that still stand today. Some converted many Red School monasteries to the Yellow School. Some would later become the first Dalai Lama and the first Panchen Lama, and some even reconnected with the Mongols after centuries of separation and did the unthinkable, reviving Tibetan Buddhism in Mongolia, and converting Mongols to the newly founded Yellow School. You know there are a lot of legendary facts about Tibetan Buddhism, and、uh, here's one for you: the first Dalai Lama is in fact not. The first Dalai Lama. I mean, when he was alive, he probably didn't even know what Dalai meant, because the word Dalai is not even Tibetan. It is the Mongolian word for the ocean. It's true that Zhong Kiba founded the Yellow School, and it's also true that generations of Yellow School followers made it extremely popular in Tibet. But it was actually the Mongols who consolidated its position. Strange, right? I mean, after the fall of the Yuan Empire, the two lost contact for 220 years. So, how did these two reconnect after all this? And who is the first Dalai Lama anyway? Well, it all started with this guy, Sonam Gyatso, the third, or shall I say, the first Dalai Lama. You see, after the fall of the Yuan Empire, Tibetan Buddhism quickly declined among the Mongols, and shamanism returned to its former glory. However, after two centuries of chaos, it appeared that there wasn't a single shaman or Khan that was even remotely close to Kokuchu or Chinggis that could unite the Mongols. But that didn't stop generations of Mongols from trying, and one of them who tried particularly hard. Was this guy, Artun Khan, the founder of Hohut, the capital city of Inner Mongolia? By 1552, he had united most of the tribes south of the Gobi and even controlled the remains of the old Mongol capital Kurukrom. But as Artun Khan got older, he became increasingly interested in Tibetan Buddhism, and to consolidate his territory from the Great Wall all the way to Kurukrom, he needed legitimacy, and reviving Tibetan Buddhism. Seemed like a wonderful idea, so Artun Khan invited the leader of the Yellow School, So Nam Gyatso, to have a meeting. Meanwhile, in Tibet, things were changing fast for the Yellow School, in a bad way, because you see, despite being extremely popular all over Tibet, the Yellow School was still the new kid in the class. Remember, there were dozens of different Tibetan Buddhism schools. Some of them were 600 years older than the Yellow School. And this unusual growth of the new kid was making one of them extremely uncomfortable. The Red School. There was always tension between these two, but since the 16th century, the tension started to escalate a little bit. The Red School leaders banned the Yellow School followers from celebrating the Tibetan New Year and all kinds of stuff. The Yellow School leaders were concerned about the future and were eager to promote Yellow School outside Tibet and seek alliances. Therefore, after getting rounds of invitations from Artun Khan, the head of Yellow School, Sonam Gyatso, finally made up his mind and went on a journey that would change the fate of every Mongol and every Tibetan. So, in 1577, when Sonam Gyatso was 34 years old and Artun Khan was about 70, the two finally met in Qinghai. Despite the huge age gap. Sonam did a wonderful job converting not just Artun Khan but many other Mongol leaders, 
One of them was Arten Han's nephew and a leader of the Ottoman Rose, who was so touched by Sonam's teaching that he adopted the Yellow School as the state religion and built this monastery on the ruins of Kirk Rome. Alrighty, so this is the uh, oldest surviving Buddhist temple in Mongolia. And uh, I think the thing that really surprises me is the uh, very top structure of this temple. Instead of two sheep kneeling, looking at each other towards a golden whale, this one has two elephants heading to the uh, opposite direction. And the golden whale in the center was replaced by like that. So this one is the only functioning monastery in Harihoen. And I just went inside and the, the lama praying, chanting, and the local Mongolians uh, you know, donating stuff. And I only see like less than 10 lamas there. And this temple is the traditional one. There's two sheep looking at each other and the golden whale uh, at the center. What an interesting place, huh? All kinds of temples, all Tibetan Buddhism, but different. Fun. So uh, behind me is the uh, uh, Golden Pagoda and uh, you can see the Mongolians just walk by me and the, uh, I think they just carried some Buddhism classics with them. They can bring it home somewhere to study. So Nam translated Yellow School classics into Mongolian, making it easier for the Mongols to understand. He also announced that he was the reincarnation of Trija Papa, who converted Kublai Khan, while Artan Khan was the reincarnation of Kublai Khan himself, and that they had come together again in this life to propagate Buddhism. Artan Khan was very glad to hear this, as his connection with Kublai Khan gave him the legitimacy he needed. Anyway, the Mongol rulers were very impressed by Sonam. Artan Khan fully embraced the Tibetan culture, starting the second stage of Mongolia's Tibetanization. And he also gave the title Dalai Lama to Sonam Gyatso. After Sonam gave this title to his two former reincarnations, he became the third Dalai Lama, which was how the modern Dalai Lama lineage began. Yep, this title we associate so much with Tibet today was actually invented by a Mongol Khan more than 440 years ago. The third Dalai Lama later died in Mongolia. Before he passed away, he said that he would be reborn as a Mongol in the next life. And depending on how you look at it, this decision could be both seen as the worst and the best decision in the history of the Yellow School, as it nearly got Yellow School completely wiped out from the surface of this planet. But in the long run, it also helped Yellow School dominate Tibet and Mongolia until now. By the time the third Dalai Lama died, Yellow School had thrived among the Mongols. Arjun Han's great grandson was identified as the fourth Dalai Lama, becoming the only Mongolian Dalai Lama. Within 50 years, virtually all Mongols had become followers of the Yellow School, with tens of thousands of monks who were loyal to the Dalai Lama. But in Tibet, things were going in the opposite direction. You see, the words of the third Dalai Lama's conversion of Mongolia quickly reached every corner of Tibet, and a small Mongol army was stationed in Lhasa guarding the Yellow School. The Red School felt threatened, and not just them. This time, even ordinary Tibetans were scared by the alliance between the Yellow School and the Mongols. 
The Yellow School was seen as a traitor who brought back the Mongol invaders. The Red School was extremely anxious and would do whatever it took to free Tibet from another Mongol incursion. And to make that happen, they first needed to get rid of the Yellow School traitors and of course the Mongolian Fourth Dalai Lama himself. So they did. In 1605, the Red School army invaded the Yellow School stronghold in Lhasa. 5,000 Yellow School monks were massacred on the spot. The Mongol guards were expelled, and the fourth Dalai Lama, only 21 years old, had to flee. He died six years later at the age of 27. However, the death of the fourth Dalai Lama failed to resolve the conflict. On the contrary, it further emboldened the Red School to attack Lhasa again in 1618. Red School soldiers plundered Yellow School monasteries, killed hundreds of its followers, and forced the rest to flee north. Many civilians were also slaughtered. Lhasa was occupied, and the Yellow School was on the verge of extinction. Under normal circumstances, this should be the end of the Yellow School. Their leader Dalai Lama was dead, monastery burned, monks killed, the Mongol guards gone. But you see, history left a tiny window open for the Yellow School. And that was all it needed. Because thanks to the third Dalai Lama, Yellow School was not alone in any fight anymore. And this brutal purge from the Red School greatly angered his biggest patron, the Mongols. The Mongol guards started filtering back in disguise and made a surprise attack on the Red School, and they won. Thanks to them, Yellow School recaptured Lhasa. But this fight between Red and Yellow was far from over. The ceasefire lasted a decade and both sides had new leaders. The fifth Dalai Lama, aka the most important Dalai Lama, was identified, and the Red School also had a new leader who was even more anti-Yellow School than his predecessor and vowed to eradicate those traitors. So by the end of the peaceful decade, he made his moves. To ensure victory, the Red School leader assembled a huge army and contacted the rulers of Kham to attack from the east. He even enlisted two Mongol armies to attack from the north. You might be a bit confused now. Wait a second, didn't you just say the Mongols were diehard Yellow School fans? Did they suddenly change sides or something? You see, uh, Yellow School might be the first to reach out to the Mongols, but certainly not the only one. The Red School also successfully converted several Mongol Khans who were eager to send help. <laughs> And when you look at this map, you must admit this war preparation was close to perfection. The pro Red School Mongols covered the north, the anti Buddhist Kham army covered the east. The anti-Tibetan Bhutanese regime blocked the south, and the Red School Tibetans themselves covered the west. Hostile forces from all sides surrounded the Yellow School, and its very existence was like a butterland flickering in the wind. It was the darkest hour. But you see, miracles, feel as they are, do exist. And in many ways, history itself is a series of miracles, which is why it is so fascinating. And at the darkest hour of the Yellow School, one miracle happened. Hearing of this upcoming attack, the Yellow School leaders met in panic and decided to try their luck with the Western Mongols, who were not very likely to send help. I mean, any rational person should know the odds of winning all this were very, very slim. But the Yellow School hit the jackpot. A small but extremely religious Mongol army was quickly assembled west of the Gobi. And this heavily outnumbered army was the miracle that happened to the Yellow School. 
His commander was known as Gush Han. Fun fact, Gush Han was actually born the same year Atan Han died. So maybe this reincarnation thing is real after all. <laughs> Who knows? So Gush Han started his campaign from the north. The pro Red School Mongol army was wiped out in 1638. The Kham army in the east was wiped out by the end of 1640. Gush Han arrived at the Red School base in Chikaze in 1641. After a year of hard fighting, Shikaze surrendered. So in 1642, after 288 years of infighting and division, Tibet was once again united, or shall I say conquered by the Mongols. Only this time, it was in the name of the Yellow School. So basically, this Mongol Khan with a small army not only saved the Yellow School from extinction, but for the first time in history, brought all of Tibet under the Yellow School. After conquering Tibet, Gush Han founded the Hoshu Khanate and migrated 100,000 Western Mongol families to Qinghai. They were later known as the Upper Mongols. But the thing is, most of the Upper Mongols are now fully Tibetanized. They look Tibetan, wear Tibetan clothes, eat Tibetan food, speak Tibetan in their day-to-day -day life, and completely forgot how to speak Mongolian generations ago. The only way to know they are actually Mongols, not Tibetans, is by looking at their IDs. Among all the Mongols, the Upper Mongols are the most Tibetanized. Following this total elimination of rivals, Gush Han made the fifth Dalai Lama the ruler of Tibet. The fifth Dalai Lama later made Lhasa the capital of Tibet and built the Potala Palace in 1649. The Yellow School has been dominating Tibet ever since. When things were finally settled in Tibet, the three lands surrounding it were all going through tremendous changes. And the fifth Dalai Lama, willingly or not, was involved and forever changed the power structure of East Asia. Once Tibet was united by the Yellow School and brought under Mongol control, the third stage of Mongolia's Tibetanization began. Mongols from every direction of Gobi started sending their brightest kids to study in Tibet under the fifth Dalai Lama and fourth Panchen Lama. Among them were two exceptionally brilliant kids. One was Gush Han's grandson, the Junga Mongol prince, Gardun. The other one was other Mongol prince, Zanabaza whose great-grandfather was Arten Han's nephew and built this. Gardun and Zanabazal would both spend years learning in Tibet. Gardun would later become the second Drinker Khan, and Zanabazal, the first supreme spiritual leader of Outer Mongolia. But the fifth Dalai Lama's influence didn't stop here. In 1644, two years after Tibet was reunited, the Manchus breached the Great Wall and conquered China proper and the six-year-old Shunzhi became the first Manchu emperor to rule over China. Like any newly conquered land, uprisings and rebellions were everywhere. To subjugate and terrorize the massive Chinese population, the Manchu leaders unleashed the massacres on cities that resisted fiercely. But the massacre was clearly not a long-term solution. The Manchu leaders needed legitimacy. Otherwise, the Chinese would never stop fighting. And this was where Tibetan Buddhism came in, providing the Manchus with just the right solution. You see, ever since Kublai Khan adopted Tibetan Buddhism as the state religion in the 13th century, it has been popular in China. After the Yuan Empire collapsed, the following Chinese Ming Empire also patronized Tibetan Buddhism, making it even more popular among Chinese. So given Tibetan Buddhism's popularity in China, the urgent need to appease the Chinese, and the news of a newly reunited Tibet, the Manchus looked to the Yellow School for help. Shunzhi sent rounds of invitations to Tibet asking the fifth Dalai Lama to visit, and the fifth Dalai Lama, who also needed Manchus to balance the upper Mongols, agreed to come. By the way, there's a six meter tall enormous mural in Potala Palace dedicated just to this event.
viewers, welcome to Beihang. The park has a lake in it, and the lake has an island in it. Just got off the boat, fresh off the boat. What a day! Oh my god! And on the top of the island, there is another white pagoda. So this one is 10 meters shorter, no, 11 meters shorter than the one I showed you before, and 372 years younger. So the uh, Manchu Emperor Shunzhi built this white pagoda for the fifth Dalai Lama, as he was the first Dalai Lama ever to visit Beijing. So in 1651, when the 35 year old Dalai Lama arrived in Beijing, the 14-year-old Xunzhi, to show his respect, uh, went out of the city to meet him. The two gave a lot of fancy titles to each other, but what they were really trying to do was that uh, Xunzhi recognized Dalai Lama's rule over Tibet, and in exchange, Dalai Lama recognized Xunzhi's rule over China. So during his stay in Beijing, the fifth Dalai Lama converted the entire Manchu royal family. And uh, to honor his visit, Xunzhi built this, which remains a must-see in any Beijing travel guide. After the fifth Dalai Lama returned to Tibet, Gushan and the fourth Panchen Lama passed away one by one, and he became the supreme leader of Tibet. And the upper Mongols were losing their grip on Tibet. Meanwhile, the Manchus were also losing their grip on China. When Shunzhi passed away suddenly at 22, and his 80-year-old son Kangxi succeeded in 1661, the Qing Empire was falling apart. The Manchu royals were fighting each other brutally for power, while the Chinese never stopped resisting. Let's be honest, this was a bit too much for an 8-year-old. But Kangxi wasn't just any 8-year-old. The young boy fought on and would later become one of the greatest emperors in China. At about the same time north of the Gobi, where life was more peaceful, the 22-year-old Zanabazi had returned home from Lhasa. After his arrival, he was recognized as the supreme leader of Ottoman Mongolia. Zanabazel was also a great artist. Throughout his life, he produced hundreds of artworks for the monasteries he built. And his most famous work is perhaps this, the symbol of Mongolia, which is literally everywhere in the country. Well, as Zanabazel was busy producing paintings and sculptures, a woman from the west of the Gobi arrived in Lhasa in 1670 to tell her son that his brother, a Junga prince, was murdered. After hearing his brother's death, this 26-year-old young man, 10 years younger than Zanabazi and 10 years older than Kangxi, who had spent 20 years in Tibet learning Buddhist canons, philosophy, astronomy, astrology, medicine, and pharmacology under the 5th Dalai Lama and 4th Panchen Lama, and earned the highest Tibetan Buddhism diploma, renounced his Lama status immediately. He rushed back home and avenged his brother in 1671. After defeating all his rebels in Dringaria seven years later, the fifth Dalai Lama gave him the highest title of Bushuk to Han, the Divan Khan. He was Karten, the second Khan of Junga Khanate, and later the biggest rebel of Kangxi. As Gardin was consolidating his position in Dringaria, Kangxi turned 20 years old. Already a seasoned ruler who spent most of his childhood crushing rebels at the court and his teenage years battling the rebels. But his real struggle was just getting started. As the three most powerful Chinese lords in southern China joined forces and revolted against him. 
At one point, Kangxi lost six provinces to the rebels and most of the Zhejiang and Jiangxi provinces. This nationwide rebellion almost ended the Qing Empire. And to Kangxi's great displeasure, the fifth Dalai Lama, a friend and teacher to Kangxi's father, also had a very close relationship with the rebel leaders. And when Kangxi asked the fifth Dalai Lama to help attack the rebels from the rear, the fifth Dalai Lama not only refused, but suggested that Kangxi make peace with the rebels by dividing China. Kangxi was absolutely livid and started to view Dalai Lama as an enemy that could threaten his rule. The rebellion was finally crushed in 1681, and a year later, the legendary fifth Dalai Lama passed away. But his death was kept secret for the next 15 years. In the meantime, things were going very well for Gardun's empire. By 1685, Dringa Khanate had become the largest nation in Central Asia and Gabdun believed he was ready to go east and challenge Kangxi. In the beginning, things went very well for them. At one point, the Zhenga army was only 350 kilometers north of Beijing. Kangxi was angered and led an army himself to fight the Zhengas, defeated Gabdun and annexed Outer Mongolia. Gabdun died in 1697. Within the same year, Kangxi received a shocking message from Tibet that the fifth Dalai Lama had passed, not in 1697 though, but 15 years earlier, in 1682. On one hand, Kangxi was extremely angry for being kept in the dark for so long, but on the other hand, this was also a wonderful opportunity for him to patronize the next Dalai Lama, which could potentially bring Tibet into his empire. But the only problem was that, you see, this idea was not original. The Dringa Mongols, the Upper Mongols, the Tibetans themselves were all thinking about it. Tensions between them quickly reached a fever pitch. Two alliances were loosely established, Upper Mongols and Manchus versus the Dringa Mongols and the Tibetans. Each team identified its own Sista Lama, claiming the other Sista Lama was fake. Because the logic here was whoever controlled the next Dalai Lama controlled the Yellow School and whoever controlled the Yellow School controlled Tibet. And they all wanted Tibet. So a clash of kings began. Long story short, after many battles between and within the two teams, Kangxi emerged victorious. His army brought the seventh Dalai Lama to Lhasa and Tibet submitted to Qing. In the middle of this big mess, many Tibetan cities were destroyed. Monks from the Red School were systematically massacred. The regent of Tibet was killed. The upper Mongol Khan was killed. The two Sista Lamas, one died on his way to Beijing, and the other disappeared in Beijing. And Emperor Kangxi himself also died. After Yongzheng succeeded him and subjugated the upper Mongols, the Manchus had effectively put Tibet under control until the early 20th century. At this point, the Manchus had already fought too many battles with the Mongols for too long and had way too many Mongols living in the empire. They needed to find a solution to settle their Mongol problem once and for all. And now, with the submission of Tibet, the Manchus finally came up with a perfect solution that had an everlasting and in many ways devastating effect on the Mongols. And now, we have arrived at the final stage of Mongolia's Tibetanization. Conquering and ruling are two very different concepts. Imagine you're running this country, and you want to keep all this fairly peaceful for a fairly long time then you have to figure out a reliable long-term policy to stick to. And when more than half of your country's territory was influenced by one religion, it is a moral obligation for you as a ruler to befriend it, and more importantly, to control it. Generations of Manchu emperors attempt to achieve this, but it wasn't until Kangxi's grandson Qianlong finally put the entirety of the Yellow School under control. 
So there's another less known fact about Tibetan Buddhism. There are not two, but four supreme spiritual leaders in the world of Yellow School. Two for Tibet, namely Dalai Lama and Panchen Lama. One for Outer Mongolia. There's also one for Inner Mongolia. So when we're talking about putting the entirety of the Yellow School under control, what we're really talking about is controlling these four lineages entirely. So anyway, by the time Kangxi passed away, the Manchus only had one lineage under control. But that was far from enough, because as long as Manchus didn't put all four lineages under control, the Mongols in the Qing Empire were not really integrated properly, as they were more loyal to the living Buddhists than the Manchu emperors. So how did Qianlong put the other three lineages under control? In 1756, an outer Mongol prince joined the Zhongyas and revolted against Qianlong. It was only a minor uprising, and the prince never got much support. Qianlong easily crushed him in January 1757, brought him and his whole family to Beijing and cut them into pieces. There's actually a statue of him in Ulaanbaatar, the capital city of Mongolia. Anyway, Qianlong then sent an execution squad to outer Mongolia to kill all the rebels they could find. Nobles who sympathized with the prince were also executed. And this is where it gets interesting because among the killed was a very special person, the brother of the second Armongo living Buddha, a direct descendant of Chinggis Khan. And his death angered many noble families in Ottoman Mongolia. They were like, wait a second, what are you Manchus doing? You can't just kill a Chinggis descendants and get away with it. And guess what? Within months, the second Ottoman living Buddha himself, the supreme spiritual leader of Ottoman Mongolia, also died at the age of 34. Some historians believe that Qianlong had something to do with this, but there was no clear evidence. However, Qianlong's actions certainly spoke louder than his words, because within the same year the second Ottoman living Buddha passed, Qianlong decreed that all future reincarnations of Outer Mongol living Buddha would be found among the Tibetans, sending a clear message he was putting an end to Outer Mongolian autonomy. And ever since, all the Outer Mongol living Buddhas, from the third all the way to the ninth, were Tibetans. And now, out of four sacred lineages, two down, two to go. Already here we are above the ground at the one only Yonghe Gong Lama Temple. Initially, this was Yongzheng's palace and where Qianlong was born. But then, when Yongzheng succeeded Kangxi and moved into the uh, Forbidden City. He converted this place into a half palace, half monastery building. So after Qianlong succeeded Yongzheng, he uh, got rid of the uh, palace part and restructured this place into a full monastery. And since then, Yongzheng Lama Temple was the center for the uh, Manchu emperors to handle the Tibetan affairs and was the uh, residence for many living Buddhas from Qinghai, Tibet, Inner Mongolia, and Outer Mongolia. Well, since I'm here, might as well just uh, uh, get this done. Not a very religious person, but uh, since I'm here, might as well do the do the thing, right? Cheers. After crushing the Dringas and consolidating Manchu authority in Outer Mongolia and Tibet, Qianlong reflected sorrowly and came to the conclusion that if he couldn't control this yellow school matter entirely, 
another wave of rebellion was only a matter of time. To reassure his people that leaving Buddhas exercised absolutely no influence over him, Qianlong passed a law that completely changed the reincarnation system of Tibetan Buddhism and wrote an article explaining it. And here's the article engraved on this six meter tall stone tablet at Byung-Hogong Lama Temple. So to make sure everyone was on the same page, Chen Long had it translated into four different languages, Mongolian, Chinese, Manchurian, and Tibetan. It is a long article, but for a good reason. And uh, there's something I want to read to you. Let's take a closer look. By the way, I'm going to read you the uh, Chinese version, uh, but don't worry if you can't understand a word because the uh, subtitle is coming right up. All right, here we go. Qing Huang Jiao, Ji Suo Yi An, Zhong Meng Gu, Suo Xi Fei Xiao, Gu Bu Ke Bu Bao Bu Zhi. Qi Lai Yi Jiu, Bu Ke Dan Shu. Shu Yi Jin Shi, Qi Feng Ri Xia, Suo Sheng Zhi Hu Bi Le Han, Shu Shu Yi Zu. 次则与世袭绝路何异？予以为大不然。盖佛本无生，其有转世？但是今无转世之糊涂可图，则数万翻僧无所归依，不得不如此耳。然转生之忽必勒罕出于异族，是乃为斯。佛其有斯，故不可不敬。兹于至一金瓶送往西藏，于凡转世之忽必勒罕，众所举数人，各书其名至瓶中。撤迁一定，虽不能尽去其弊，较之从前一人之受益者，或略功矣。乾隆 was certainly not the first Manchu emperor to come up with this、uh, demongolization via Tibetanization idea,、mm, but he was definitely the most blatant one. He was like, "Okay, enough of this sugar coating."、Uh, I'm just gonna say it. We patronize the yellow scoop because we want no further trouble from the Mongols. And you know what? I think this reincarnation thing is nonsense because, don't you know, Buddha was not born a Buddha, okay? So I'm gonna replace it with something I can visually understand and control. All future reincarnations of the living Buddhas of Mongolia and Tibet, including Dalai Lama and Panchen Lama, must go through this process. Uh, so the Tibetans are going to write the candidate's name in three different languages: Manchurian, Mongolian, Chinese, on this、uh, every little slips. And they will put the slips into the urn, the golden urn, and、uh, they will pray in front of Buddha for days before、uh, a final decision was made. And this whole thing, this entire process, will be overseen by the、uh, Manchus. So that is pretty much what Qianlong. Came up with to、uh, replace the、uh, mystical reincarnation system.、Uh, I mean, it did have a point. It is more visually understandable than the、uh, reincarnation system, right? And just like that, all four sacred lineages of Yellow School were taken care of. And once Yellow School degenerated into a state-sponsored tool to control the Mongols, everything changed. A series of policies promoting the Yellow School in Mongolia was implemented. A hierarchical system was designed. Noble titles and special social status were given to the lamas. Huge financial support to the lamas were provided, and thousands of monasteries were built for the Mongols. Because after all, building temples and paying lamas was way cheaper than having wars with the Mongols. With the strong backing of the Manchus, the Yellow School spread among the Mongols like wildfire. It not only changed the Mongols' nomadic way of life and reshaped their social structure, but greatly reduced the Mongolian population, because theoretically monks were not allowed to have kids. But the Mongols themselves didn't really mind it back then, because under the harsh conditions of the Mongolian plateau, being a lama was an excellent life choice. Lama status not only secured your livelihood but glorified your family, and just like that. The final stage of a full-blown, comprehensive Tibetanization of Mongolian society began. More and more Mongols started naming their kids with Tibetan words, using Tibetan medicine to cure diseases, and adopting Tibetan calendars and holidays. 
At the turn of the 20th century, the Mongolian society became highly dysfunctional. Almost all cities were built around the monasteries. Over a third of the male population were monks, which was an even higher ratio than in Tibet. And more than a third of the total Mongolian population were either residents or dependents of the monasteries. In 1900, there were as many as 243 living Buddhists at all levels in both Mongolia and more than 2,000 monasteries. When you think about it, you must admit this whole thing is kind of bizarre and ironic. The land that once bred the most fearsome soldiers on earth had become an incubator for monks. I don't even know what this is. It's a fleet or something. God, is weird. We just stopped at a tiny restaurant. These are my new Romanian friends. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody cleared the, the dust. <laughs> Yesterday I was in a winter storm, a snowstorm, and now this is desert. So I think right here, this is where the civilization meets wilderness. You see the road ends here, but like suddenly ends here. And every car driving will drive from a, a road to an off-road plane. Not even a sign saying, okay, this is wilderness, just, just go. Yeah, <laughs> it's very Mongolian. When the revolutionaries took power in Outer Mongolia and formed the Mongolian People's Republic, determined to modernize Mongolian society, they confronted a massive Buddhist structure that enrolled a larger part of the population, monopolized education and medical services, and controlled much of the national wealth. This struggle between revolutionaries and monks lasted nearly 20 years, and then, since 1937, all monasteries in Mongolia were destroyed or dissolved, and Tibetan Buddhism was banned. By the 1940s, nearly every monk was either dead, interned, or laicized. Since the late 1940s, only Gandan Monastery, the largest and most important monastery in Mongolia, was opened as a tourist attraction. After the 1990 overthrow of communism, there has been a resurgence of Buddhism in Mongolia, with about 200 temples now in existence. According to the national census of 2010, 53% of Mongolians identify as Buddhists. Tibetan Buddhism in Inner Mongolia went through a similar journey in China. It was virtually eradicated during the Cultural Revolution. More than 90% of the Buddhist monasteries in Inner Mongolia were destroyed. Since the 1980s, there has been a modest revival with the reconstruction of some important monasteries and some new smaller temples. So this is how Mongols were Tibetanized. It started with the power struggle between Chinggis Khan and Shaman Kokchu, introduced to Golden Khan by Sajabandita, promoted by Kublai Khan and Trija Papa, revived by Atun Khan and Sir Dalai Lama, consolidated by Gush Khan and the Fifth Dalai Lama, and was in full bloom under the Manchurian rule. If we take a step back and look at what Yellow School has been through over the centuries, we will find a history full of compromises and cooperation. 
always looking for the most powerful patron, converting it, giving it legitimacy, and seeking protection from it, first from the Mongols and later from the Manchus. This is how Yellow School survived and survived. And it was in this centuries-long process that Mongolian society was changed forever, where the hunter became the hunted, conqueror became the conquered. But when Yellow School itself went out of control and got in the way of social change, it was crushed as well, the same way the Red School and shamanism were crushed. One takeaway from this story is that now or then, East or West, religion must work with the state. It thrives when it benefits the state and dies when it damages the state. Because for politicians, religion has always been a tool. What interests them the most is certainly not inner peace, patience, or goodness. Those qualities are for the people. What politicians want from religion is always legitimacy. The legitimacy to rule, to invade, sometimes to protect, and most of the time, to kill. And if this tool isn't doing its job properly, but there's always another one. Despite its revival since the 1980s, Tibetan Buddhism is inarguably still in decline. Especially with the recent child abuse cases in Gandan Monastery just one month after my visit, and the recent scandal of the 14th Dalai Lama himself, a further decline of Tibetan Buddhism in both reputation and international influence is almost guaranteed. On my recent trip to Mongolia and Inner Mongolia, I noticed a gradual de-Tibetanization. Mongols are back to naming their kids in Mongolian, younger generations are becoming less religious, and with access to the internet, mobile phones, and video platforms, new cultures and values are changing Mongolian society. And who knows what's going to happen from here. Alright, we have arrived at the end of the journey. This is obviously a massive oversimplification of the saga between the Mongolian and Tibetan plateaus. And if you want to read more about this, I will drop some links in the description. And if you want to see the Tibetan traces in Mongolia and China by yourself, pack your bag, travel, and connect. Throughout this video, I've mentioned Inner Mongolia many times. It is a huge autonomous region in China, bigger than France, Germany, and the United Kingdom combined. In fact, more Mongols live in Inner Mongolia than in the actual country of Mongolia. And if you're wondering why there are two Mongolias between China and Russia and how Mongolia split into two, you can watch it here. And if you want to know more about the land where Mongolia meets Tibet, you can click this video right here. Thank you so much for watching such a long video. I really, really appreciate that. Subscribe if you're not already, and I will see you in the next one. Cheers.